Hello and welcome to episode number 34 of the Chief Stakes and Controllers podcast, presented by Fox PHL The Gambler, 102.5 FM, 1480 AM, and iHeart Radio. My name is esports and gaming insider Jason Finelli, and I have a trio of amazing uh, interviews for you this evening. We're going to talk to the director of esports for one of the longest running esports organizations in north america we're going to talk to a business-minded game journalist and friend of mine who was all over the gamestop stock situation and finally we're going to round things out with a talk about a recently released retro game by the developer or publisher themselves so we are going to have a great night let's not waste any more time and get into these six in 60 seconds Immortals defeat Envy in the first open qualifier for Valorant Champions Tours Finals, the first closed qualifiers coming up this weekend. Team Liquid wins the League of Legends LCS lock-in tournament with a hard fart victory over Cloud9 in the finals. Team Solo Mid has announced their departure from competitive Fortnite and released all three players they had signed to their roster. Meanwhile, Google Stadia discontinues in-house development of first-party games, where Google will be shifting focus to strictly third-party streaming. Borderlands developer Gearbox Entertainment was acquired by Sweden-based Embracer Group for $1.3 billion. And finally, the long-awaited Mass Effect Legendary Edition release date is revealed as May 14th. Those are your six in 60 seconds. Yes, folks, the 6 and 60 seconds are right there, and they are brought to you tonight by the sponsor for Cheek Stakes and Controllers. That is Ghost Shaver. With Ghost Shaver, you will have a shave above the rest. That is, it is designed to feel like it is an extension of your arm, allowing users to reach anywhere on your head, face, or body. Its persistent cutting system will give you a close and smooth shade. Five different rotary flex action super thin blades with a patented handheld design that fits into the palm of your hand precisely. Go to ghostshaver.com for more information and to order yours today. That's ghostshaver.com. All right, and now on to our first interview of the episode, a three pack of interviews for you this evening. And this one might be the biggest one of them all. They're all special in their own way, but I'm really excited about this one because we have here... Uh, one of the directors, one of the top men, top people in the longest running esports organization in North America, founded all the way back in 1999. That is Evil Geniuses. And right here we have the director of esports, Mr. Greg Kim. Greg, how are you today? Good, good. Just uh, wrapping up a day of work. Thanks for having me, Jason. Well, I'm glad to catch you at the end of the day. I hope it wasn't too stressful. Everything all good? Yeah, not too bad. You know, it's pretty busy with all of our games firing on full cylinders but it's it's a joy to watch our teams compete so all good stuff it is it is i've been following evil geniuses a long time back in the days when you had signed uh, justin wong and the fighting game community that's where i really cut my teeth in esports uh coverage so very excited to uh to talk to you today let's start with um valorant your newest esport uh you had just announced that you were joining valorant last week after uh i think two years uh, nearly two years of not joining any new esports. Your last uh, entry into a new esport, I believe, was September 2019 and uh, CSGO. So walk me through the decision process to joining Valorant or deciding to join Valorant. That now, was, now was the time to jump in. Uh, I imagine that format-wise, it wasn't that difficult because CSGO and Valorant are very, very similar. Uh, but there's always probably some trepidation in joining a brand new esport. So walk me through that process. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, first of all, part of it's sort of the undertaking that we took in, in 2019 in bringing on League of Legends and CSGO, okay. right? I think Evil Geniuses has always been a, a proud organization in Dota, but we added two of the two of the most premier esports in that year in both League and CSGO, which is massive undertakings, both in like 
getting acquainted with new competitive spaces to, you know, managing two like triple A esports title teams. So uh, I think part of it was getting our feet under us. And also I think, you know, wanting to make sure that we were entering Valorant in a way that really aligned with our core organizational values in a way that we thought made sense. Cause you know, Valorant's only been out since June, July of this year. It's almost crazy to think that it's been less than a year that the game's out. Right. It feels um, like it's been around forever. It's June 2nd. It was out. Yeah, totally. So, you know, I think we were keeping a pulse on the scene. We didn't want to just sort of jump right in. I think it's still early in the game's life cycle where, sure, yeah no team is necessarily figured out like what the optimal Valorant team looks like. So, you know, we wanted to wait for the right opportunity and we wanted to build something from scratch. We didn't just want to like wholesale import in like a Counter-Strike team, for example. And so, you know, when, when the finally, like the, the, what felt like really the, the right opportunity for us came by in, in this roster built around Potter, we were so excited and we just jumped right in. So was Potter the first one that became available to you? When did those discussions start? She was. It, it, it kind of started like towards the holiday season, I want to say. Like, you know, obviously Potter has a storied career in Counter-Strike and she had competed in the summer, I want to say, in, in an all-women's Valorant tournament. And, you know, we caught wind that she was thinking about returning to pro play. She's, she's been doing a lot of Counter-Strike broadcasts these days. And so once we caught wind of that, you know, I think we, we set up a couple conversations with her and I, I think quickly realized that, you know, we had someone like a good foil, a mature veteran leader and someone that we could bring in to work with to really build a team around like from the bottom up. And and that's important to us in so many ways and with respect to like building the culture, um, finding the right pieces to fit a strategy, like, uh, you know, being able to develop talent. Like we're, we're so excited to be able to work with some of her, her caliber and her stature to, to get this done. Now, I'm noticing also... Um as far as your roster is concerned, there aren't many female uh, competitors in Valorant yet, at least not based on the first strike tournament back in December uh, that I had watched. And you have two. You have two big ones here. So was diversity and bringing in as many, uh, not only the best players, but also a diverse roster of players uh, important? Or was it more of a just get the best players out there and and uh, it just so happens that two of them are female? I think it was the latter. It was, it was, again, it was building a team around, you know, the values that we wanted to have. And I think the strategy that we wanted to have Claudia, who we brought in with Potter had, had played with her before in that women's tournament over the summer. So there was some familiarity there and it gave us sort of a building block. And I think quickly over the course of several weeks of tryouts and, and working with Potter and working with um, our analysts and trying other players like we we found what we thought were the right pieces to put around Potter and Claudia and in Alexander temperature and Osias that that really resonated with us because we knew like we had Potter right she's our in-game leader she's going to call the strategy she's going to play these type of agents that, that see the map and, and let her to play very let her play very tactically and we wanted to surround her with really high mechanical talent to just sort of go out and 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 execute and get the job done we think we have that with our with our team yes now alexander um he, he was he playing valorant uh for a long time i'm seeing here he's been playing since at least uh when the game came out in 2020 was he playing anything before that or did he debut uh um, in valorant I I think Alex had some more background, some some light background in Counter Strike before before sure. Valorant. But both Alex, uh, Alexander, and Temperature came to us from Moon Raccoons, um, okay. a, a sort of lesser known org that had seen some seen some success actually in some of the some of the early tournaments in Valorant. And I think you know their names were were touted among a roster that a lot of a lot of people speculated like an, an organization might just pick up Moon Raccoons wholesale. But you know I think for us. Um, we wanted to sort of pick and choose pieces that, that made the most sense for us. And obviously, Alexander's super talented, Temperature's super talented. So we were thrilled to be able to bring the two of them out of that team into our roster. Sure, sure. Now, before I get to my next question, I would just like to point out uh, that Moon Raccoons is an excellent name. <laughs> that uh, any Moon Raccoons, there's who, who was the, uh, the League of Legends team in Worlds? Unicorns of Love. Some of these esports teams have fantastic names. I just want to put that out there. Evil Genius is a very good one, too. For um, sure. Don't don't get me wrong, but Moon Raccoons, that's hard to beat. It's a unique one, <laughs> totally. <It's> certainly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in taking this approach to building a team from scratch instead of just buying a Moon Raccoons or acquiring Moon Raccoons, did you worry about 
chemistry. I mean, you had said that the players had some background from the women's tournament and the other two players who had played together, but bringing all five of them onto one team, was there a, a concern that there might be some, some uh, like a learning curve in chemistry, or were, were you confident that they would just be able to go right out and start playing? I think we evaluated for it because I think like, you know, something we we broadly just sort of accept as a as a core important facet of, of managing our teams is that chemistry is just ultimately at, at the end of the, the day so important. Right. In League of Legends, like our chemistry affects how we play around the map, how we craft like team based advantages and and how we how we go about executing strategies and Counter Strike just as in Valorant, like, you know, Believing in yourselves and your teammates and having like high mentals um, goes such a goes such a far away in performance. So when we were piecing this team together, like it was it was something we kept a keen ear out for and keen eye out for in the tryout, sort of seeing, okay, like you know obviously these guys are talented and they can they can click very well, they can shoot very well, they're very talented, but you know how also are they getting along interpersonally? How excited are they potentially to join <clears throat> evil geniuses and also like. What are their career goals, right? Like, is there is there alignment here? Like, do they want to, you know, how how important is it to them to just to to compete and to win? And how important is it them to them to have like a very strong and solid team culture to build off of? It, we screen for all of those things when we were trying them out, and I think sure. we're very happy with what we landed on. Sure, and they actually picked up their first win in the open qualifier this past weekend. Stage one open qualifier uh, for the Valorant Champions Tour. That had to feel pretty good, right? Getting that first win right it, off their back. It, it did, particularly because, you know, we were we were pushing up towards the date of the tournament and piecing the team together. So re- in reality, the team had only had, I want to say, a few days of formalized like practice as a team. Like obviously wow. they, they had scrimmed together and played pugs as a part of the tryout, but we hadn't really like gotten together with our coach and our team to like do like layout strategies and walk through maps until like very shortly before the tournament. So we were of course thrilled to get the first win. It's a pity we couldn't get two. We felt like we could have gotten the second, but you know, the team's been working hard ever since that. Like, you know, they took no day off. They've been working hard since then. And we have another weekend of open qualifiers coming up in a week or so. So we're excited to see how we stack up with more practice for sure. Should the Valorant uh, community be ready for evil geniuses now that week two is coming up uh i i hope they keep an eye out for us i i, I think this is definitely uh this is a this is a team that we're going to grow with and, and the valor and esports scene is going to grow with and you know I'm, I'm excited for the results in the interim but i'm also excited to see how they flourish in month two month three and, and month six and beyond for sure for sure, yes, absolutely. Uh, so real quick, one last Valorant question before we move on. Uh, because you have another team in CSGO, and uh, after talking to a lot of the players during that first strike tournament in December, a lot of them came from CSGO. Uh, was there any thought put into taking some of your CSGO talent and asking them to try Valorant, or was it, or was that not, did that violate the whole build a team from scratch mentality <laughs> that you were going for? I think it was a little bit of that. I think it's a little bit of, you know, it's funny. Like, we, we kind of joked about that, and we joke about, like, bringing over our tour into League of Legends, for example, right, from Dota. <laughs> from but Dota. I think, <laughs> yeah. But I think uh, these guys are, you know, they're all, like, the, our Counter-Strike guys are, are at the top of their top of their game and, and they've honed their craft in counter-strike right and and just like we're trying to form an identity in valorant and build a team culture uh together like that team also is a cohesive unit and has been playing together for some time so you know i, I think that they're, they're very much focused on being one of the top teams of the world in counter-strike and and we had different aspirations in valorant so we didn't want to entertain disturbing what we have in csgo and those guys are hard at work training and competing in europe right now so um we sort of kept the we kept the two games siloed a bit. That's the only place that uh, competitions going on right now in CS:GO. Right over in Europe, there's not really a North American scene. Yeah, at least at the top level, I think we see a lot of our you know a lot of the league partners that we uh, the leagues that we compete in like they're very focused in Europe. A lot of the world's top teams are in Europe, so we've had to navigate some operational. Um, you know, some interesting operational challenges, just getting the team over in Europe and having them, you know, get accustomed to the jet lag and practicing on the ground and like getting up to speed on, uh, on like, you know, competing in Europe before they go into their tournaments, but, um, they're holding their own. Sure. Sure. Now Dota two is making its comeback, uh, from 
the pandemic. There was not a lot of Dota 2 played last year, and your first match is this weekend, correct? Am I seeing that right? Uh, we've had we've had a couple DPC matches, but we do have one coming up this weekend. But uh, um, how has the team adjusted to uh, pandemic play as opposed to being able to play normally? Yeah, I think it's been interesting, I th- especially because you know we're a team that that had two has two key pieces who are based abroad, like you know, um, Abba being based in the Philippines and Daryl being based in Singapore. Like this this Dota this this DPC. Um, set of games was the first time that we've actually had our starting roster back together, like pretty much since the pandemic broke out. Wow. Um, up until this point, you know, a lot of last year we were playing games with various stand-in players or subs. And, and so, of course, we're, we're thrilled to have the team able to, to all play together, like with our full starting roster and what we believe is a world-class team. Um, so that's been great, and I think like those guys have certainly shown what they have. I believe they're undefeated in groups so far. <laughs> Um, and we look forward to just seeing them continue to excel and, and continue to, to, you know, keep their elite status as a Dota team. It's excellent. And uh, your League of Legends team also kicks off this Sunday, um, going right up against the Super Bowl. That's brave. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty brave of you. But uh, looks like you're taking on who am I? A hundred thieves in the in the first uh, your first spring set this oh, this Friday. Excuse me, is mm-hmm. your first game uh, Sunday is you're up against where is it i'm looking at it right here golden guardians at five o'clock so right before kickoff oh boy (laughs) (laughs) um what what should we look forward to from evil geniuses in the league of legends season this year is there a particular player or uh rivalry that you are excited to really dig into or uh is this more like an all hands on deck let's do well for the na this year I think it's an all hands on deck type thing. I think like, you know, I think we we recently played in the LCS lock-in tournament, which is sort of like the the prelude to the regular season, yep, kind yep. of like the community shield in, in in like English Premier Football and and we we showed some flashes of brilliance there, right? I think we're a team that has high upside. I think there're mixed expectations for us, but I think all in all as a team, I think we're as a unit going to be one of the most exciting teams to watch in the league. Like we have a very explosive player in Jizuke in our mid lane. We have we have all these pieces that that we think, um, you know, uh, on a good day can take on anyone in the league and and play in a style and manner that's pretty exciting, right? And and pretty, pretty, uh, pretty fight heavy within the game. So. Um, I would say it's a bit of everyone. I would say, like, you know, if we succeed, it's going to look amazing. If we go down, we're going to go down in, in, a, in a flash of brilliance and, and in there flames. It and it'll it'll be exciting no matter what. That Love is for that. sure. Blaze of glory. And coming at third, fourth place, uh, semifinals, camp, that's, that's pretty good. So, yeah, you guys are, uh, unfortunately, Team Liquid had your, had your number, but, you know. Nah, yeah, <laughs> those guys are pretty good, but are. We'll, we'll get them next time. Yeah, yeah. I would like to see uh, Evil Geniuses representing in Worlds uh, one of these years. So let's make, for sure. Let's we make that, that happen, sir. <laughs> so uh, last question for you before we get out of here. I want to talk about your fighting game roster. So you currently have Sonic Fox, The Kill Sage, mm-hmm. Ricky Ortiz, and you did have uh, PPMD, but he has since retired after mm-hmm. seven years with the org. Um Obviously, fighting games were affected most by the pandemic in a big, big, big way, starting to slowly come back into its own. But I don't really think it's going to pop until the live crowds are back. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know how you feel about that. But what, where do you see the, the opportunity in the future of fighting games and fighting game esports? Is it going to go back to the way it was? Will there need to be some adjustments made in the structure of tournaments? How do we deal with all of the you know, madness of last summer with the uh, speaking out uh, that, they, that the, that the uh, community went through. Where is Where are fighting games going in your eyes as you sit uh, with EG? Yeah, I mean, I would say, first of all, that I that I hope they return to, to what they were and they keep, keep, you know, they catch up to their progress and keep growing from where they were before the pandemic, right? I think fighting game, the FGC has always been a unique and very vibrant community within right. esports, and I would love to see it return to where it was and... and you know, build from there, right? Rather than being set back by, by all the unfortunate COVID externalities. But I think like in the near to medium term, I think like what we're seeing a little bit is um, the importance of, uh, it's a, it's an old argument, but the importance of net, net code and having good online capabilities. You know, we were, we were fortunate to have to kill Sage win. Uh, I think it was skull girls at frosty fastings just yes. this past weekend. And, you know, even looking at that tournament, right? Like a lot of what used to be the main games at like an Evo or the other events were sort of uh, 
well, not pushed to the side, but they weren't featured as heavily as ones that have really excellent online, like Skullgirls, like like Guilty Gear, like some of the other titles. So I think in like the interim, until we, we get the vaccines in and the pandemic sort of calms down a little bit, I think it's the games that have excellent netcode and ability to play be played online um, are going to be are going to be pretty interesting spaces to be in. I think um, you know, as someone who used to work at Riot, I would say we're all waiting with bated breath to see what comes out from Riot when that fighting game finally oh, comes out. We, Who knows oh, we <laughs> oh Project L be still my heart. I can't yeah. wait to see that. Yeah. Who knows when, but I think we'll be excited to see that. But I think like, you know, in that vein, you know, the games that, that are able to adapt to online play for now, I think are going to be the ones that are the most interesting. And then hopefully once we come out of the pandemic, we'll be able to get back to some of the norms and, and continue that growth. Right. And I'm sure, I, I hope there'll be a lot of energy returning to that former glory and, and, and that'll just catapult us into the future. I agree. I've talked to a lot of fighting game players, like locally in Philly, and there's a, as a Facebook group that I'm a part of, a couple other guys, and they are chomping at the bit to get back <laughs> into uh, whether it's the ballroom of a hotel or uh, the Evo Stadium, to, or the locals even, just to get back and fighting. Uh, you're definitely right about that. So, Greg, I do appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy. you got a lot going on over there at Evil Geniuses. So for you to take 20 minutes to come talk to me means a lot. I wish you the best of luck in all of your seasons this year, and hopefully the next time we talk, we're not just talking about starting a season. We're talking about ending it on top. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Greg Kim. Have a great day, sir. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. A big thanks to Greg Kim for joining me tonight. Wishing all the luck in the world to evil geniuses in the future in whatever game they play. And I sure hope that uh, when fighting games come back that EG is right on top of the list. Uh, bringing the heat as they always do in whatever game they're playing. Uh, but let's not talk about esports anymore. Now we've got to talk about the games we're going to play this week. Two well, three, technically, big-time titles for you to take a look at. So get out those glasses, and let's have a taste of what's on tap. The remasters for Neo and Neo 2 are finally here, bringing both games to the PlayStation 5 with updated graphics and updated frame rate. Or if you're more into the horror genre, Little Nightmares 2 continues the saga that from the first game, Little Nightmares, brought to you by Bandai Namco. Three games... Uh, two remasters and one spooky horror game for those who like to be spooked. What's on tap for you? All right, moving on now to our second segment of the evening. The second of our big interviews slated in Cheese Steaks and Controllers this week. If you have been paying attention at all to financial news, you would have heard two words. GameStop and Stonks. Now, Stonks, I... I'm very sorry about it, just the way the internet culture works, for those that aren't aware. Uh, but for those who are wondering why the GameStop phenomenon happened, and if something like this could ever happen again, I have brought in a ringer for you today. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, former news editor for Game Informer, now hosts a fantastic podcast on the business of gaming called Virtual Economy. His name is Mike Futter. Mike, how are you? I'm doing well, Jason. It is good to talk to you, my friend. Happy to have you here, my friend. So, uh, for the layman, aka the people who invested in GameStop just because they heard everybody else was doing it, walk me through, like, in the beginnings of this phenomenon, how this actually was able to happen. Because there's got to be more than just a bunch of Reddit folks who want to tell the uh, hedge funds to go, you know, fly a kite. Sure, and I think that that's gotten a lot of the attention, is the whole concept of uh this david versus goliath thing where uh hedge funds are the goliath and redditors are the david and i think that's a really interesting story and i think that that's why that is the big takeaway that people have from this now i think it's important that we go back and do a quick timeline look and understand like where gamestop has been to understand why gamestop uh what happened with gamestop exactly. sure yep so if you look back a year ago uh, between about January and September of 2020, so this goes, this predates the pandemic, um, and it was through most of the pandemic. I had been tracking GameStop shares, uh, share price, uh, because we report on earnings every every quarter, and GameStop happens to stick out because they're they're offset a little bit. They are a month later, uh, so their fiscal year actually closed a couple days ago on January 31st. Okay. So their stock price was bouncing between three dollars and fifty cents and five dollars. It had these really weird bounding 
areas. It had this floor of about three fifty and the ceiling of about five dollars, and it didn't really go outside of them. Uh, and that's about what you would expect because GameStop, even though um, if you look throughout the pandemic, even though consoles uh, hardware sales went up, which is not what we expect to see right before a new generation. Correct. Uh, they were they were slow to adapt. They they wasted an entire generation adapting to digital. Then around September 2020, uh, things started to pick up a little bit, and their stock started to increase. We're getting closer to the the new console generation. GameStop clearly hasn't gone anywhere. They haven't gone gone bankrupt. Um, and then things kind of really start to turn around in October. Uh, they were trading at about $10. Mid-October, the news comes out that there is some kind of deal between Microsoft and GameStop, where Microsoft is giving GameStop some sort of revenue share uh, for every console, new or used, that GameStop sells into the ecosystem. Now, we're not not—we're pretty sure that's just Xbox Series X and extra Xbox Series S, or the extra small small, as we call it on the <laughs> economy. Um but this was this was this friction that started to happen, and this is when we started paying very close attention to what was going on with GameStop. Because on one hand, you have this company, Loop Capital, that says, hey, this revenue share is happening, but we do not think it's material. We think it is a fraction of a percent in order to keep GameStop happy uh, because things like uh, Xbox All Access, which includes uh, Game Pass, which cuts right. into GameStop's game sale margin, um, you know, that makes it hard for GameStop to, to uh, feel good about selling consoles. Sure. So this was a gimme, according to Loop Capital. Now, Loop Capital is a short seller. On the other side is Domo Capital. Uh, and we talked um, to Justin Dapirala, who is, uh, I think he is Domo Capital. He is uh, Domo he's Capital. Long. So they're long on GameStop. So so Justin has this this lofty view of GameStop and how the company is in the middle of of reforming and how everything's going great. So you have these two opposing forces here. You've got a short seller and you've got um, somebody who's long. Okay. Now, I'm glad to talk about what short selling is in, in very simple terms. So I, I used uh, – I, I go on every Thursday with the program mm-hmm. director on his show, and I used the analogy that I saw on Twitter of Casino Royale, where um, – the Redditors, in this case, are James Bond. The short sellers are the villain, Le Chief, I think it is. Mm-hmm. Chief, yep. how say it. And then the plane that was supposed to be blown up but wasn't is GameStop. Is that apt? Um, yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that works. I, I think, I think the, the thing that, that people need to understand is that our, our rudimentary understanding, of, for people who don't understand the stock market, the thing that you're taught is buy low, sell high. Correct, yes. You want to get in low, make your money, see that stock go up, and then sell, and then reap those rewards. What we, we, we aren't taught, and at least not in an intro level, is that there's another side of that, which is somebody who really thinks a company is, is on its way out. Uh, and it's betting against that company. So, you, so you, you're not selling your own shares. And I think, that this is, I think that's where the James Bond analogy is good, because uh, James is not playing with his own money at right. that point. He's okay. borrowing that money. And that's sort of what stock shorting is. You're borrowing shares from somebody who owns them. You're selling them into the market high, but at some point you need to return those shares, which means you need to purchase those shares. So, okay, so, the, the, so, I, the, so the idea is you borrow the shares, you sell them high, the stock tanks, and you purchase them back lower, and that's where you make your profit. Exactly. Okay. Now, the, the, there, is a, there is a time limit on this because as – and this is why I referenced GameStop nearing the end of its fiscal year. Uh, when you when a fiscal year ends and you are reporting the earnings and you're getting through that, there's also an annual meeting. And typically there are voter motions that have to uh, – that happen at an annual meeting. Sure. Yep. You cannot vote as a shareholder if you don't actually possess your shares. So if you loaned your shares out and they're still in the market and they haven't been returned to you, you can't vote. But you, as the owner of those shares, can call those shares in at any time. So, Ooh. yeah. So that's so that it sounds almost like a like a like a mafia like a mafioso move. It, I'm doing this favor for you, but when I call, you need to return the favor, sort of deal. Right. I mean, at the very least, you got to give me back my property. Right. Yeah. Like I'm loaning you this game, but if I want to go play it again, that is a much you know, better analogy. Yes. You got to give it back to me. <laughs> 
If there's a new, if there's some new DLC, you got to get that back to me. Sure. So, so, so this is where this perfect storm was created in the first weeks of January. I, I think so, but it's important to understand that 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 the stock price was still pinned to GameStop's actions through middle of this month. So at the end of December, the stock price naturally went up to $20. At this point, we see the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series consoles selling out. Yep. You know, GameStop is obviously selling through its entire allocation, which is good and bad. Good because that means the consoles are doing well. Bad because it means they're bounded by supply. They're supply constrained. Sure. So they're not making as much money as they could conceivably if there was more supply. Then in, on January 11th, every year GameStop looks at a nine-week holiday period and they report their holiday sales. Okay. So on January 11th, this came out. They uh, announced that you know year over year holiday sales are down a couple of percent, which on the which by itself is not great. However, if you think about the fact that they've closed something like twenty uh, percent of their stores, or they're on track to close twenty percent of their stores, I think it's eleven hundred stores they've closed at this point. Something like that, yeah. Then what they have is store comparables. So they look at how many stores they had, and they look at e-commerce, which is lumped in. Their e-commerce has gone up like three hundred percent year wow. over year because people aren't going into stores. Sure, yeah. So uh, you lump all that together, and suddenly, hey, their comps go up 5%. Now, remember, that's just the revenue side of the equation. Mm -hmm. On the expense side, they've closed 1,100 stores. So they're not paying rent. They're not paying staff. They're not paying for inventory to supply those stores. So if you look at the at, at the bottom line, yeah, their total sales have gone down, their comparables have gone up, and their expenses have, have decreased, which is part of that, what they call their de-densification strategy in closing stores. So also at this point, they announced that Ryan Cohen, who took Chewy from this little pet pet supply company to this enormous uh, success joins the board and the stock jumps up to $30 by January 13th. Wow. Yeah. So now we've been doing this for gosh, a week and a half. So, uh, so Friday was what the first, uh, Third, uh, 29, 29. So the 29th, 22nd, this all started. So we're talking nine days later Whew. after Ryan Cohen joins the board, then you have this Reddit thread of this story and there is this guy uh who who goes by the vulgar form of deep effing value uh on reddit <laughs> oh, thank you for censoring i forgot to mention as we were getting ready for this that this will air on live radio so your censorship is very much appreciated no problem uh <laughs> it is it is my pleasure to not drop an f-bomb on your show <laughs> so so this guy has been tracking GameStop since late 2019 and, and has laid out this case for how, why GameStop's going to turn it around. Now, he's a true believer. Yep, yep. He truly believed in GameStop. And I think he bought he bought relatively low, so something around the $10, 15 range. So him, him being a true believer isn't costing him very much unless he's buying right. hundreds of thousands of shares. Right. So the thing here is now he has put forward, he's, and he's made this case now broad to, to Reddit. Ryan Cohen's joined the board. Look what Ryan Cohen did. Look at these holiday sales. Look at all of this. GameStop's going to blow up. At the same time, it's pointed out that GameStop shares have been so shorted that their float, which is the, the percentage of total shares, uh, or percentage of shares that are publicly available against the total number of shares, which you would assume would be capped at 100%. Right. Because you can't have more shares than there are total shares, right? Right, yeah. Well, except the float was 138%. Don't ask me why. I have some theories about this. There's some worries about some illegal activity called naked shorting. We don't need to go into that if you don't want to. We can if you do. So but, so basically there was 38% more shares than were actually available being short sold? Yes. Uh, and it's 38% more than the total number of shares, not even the normal float because when you look at what's publicly available it's shares that aren't in lockup right that, that, so if you're in a quiet period those can't be traded you know things like that yikes so so 138 percent that float is now down to 121 percent so it's still more than 100 percent uh so reddit notices that how badly this stock is shorted says you know what we're gonna screw the hedge funds <laughs> and, and they make this huge case, and suddenly it becomes this meme. The, the, the memification of the GameStop stock uh, causes people to, to go and buy and buy and buy and buy and buy and push the value up. Now, at the same time, you've got uh, short sellers who sold in the shares that they borrowed at 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 45, and the stock on Friday, January 22nd, jumps to $150, 
Currently, it is, and I'm just refreshing Market Watch, $111. And if you look at the graph, it's absolutely bonkers because that stock, um, when I uh, last Thursday hit nearly $500 in pre market trading. That was the peak, right? For something? That was the peak. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is, this is the moment where you have what's called a short squeeze, where short sellers have to cover at some point. And they have to either cover when those shares are called in or when they decide, you know what, I've already lost too much money. I'm getting out. Okay. So if they purchase the stock, the stock even at $50, right, and the shares are at 450 and they panic – and they've got thousands upon thousands of shares. They're losing four hundred dollars for every, every share, share that they have. My goodness. Well, but oh. and here's the thing: at at that point, remember you've got people fueled by momentum buying, sure, who are okay. rushing to purchase shares, and the availability is low. And then you have short sellers covering, which means they have to buy shares, which causes what's called a gamma squeeze. Where that is this this cyclical effect of now short sellers are selling and that drives the the price even further up. Hmm. So uh, obviously now we're seeing the tail end of that. Now along the way, what happened was you've got these retail uh, retail brokers like Robinhood, like uh, Schwab, trading two twelve, and uh, oh, there was one more that that did this. Uh, TD Ameritrade was another one where they just stopped allowing you to purchase GameStop stock. And that caused it, an absolute uproar. And it tanked the stock. It tanked yeah. the stock very, very quickly. They allowed you to close out your position, which means they allowed you to sell, but you couldn't purchase anymore, which drove the value down another couple hundred dollars. It has been a roller coaster. So then, of course, people are absolutely upset. Fidelity being like one of the only retail uh retail traders left that or retail brokers left that's allowing you to purchase GameStop. People are flooding off of Robinhood trying to get their money out so they can move it over to uh to Fidelity and others that are still allowing you to trade the stock. And now it's gotten to the point where it is so hard to find shares that uh that the that the price is now in free fall again. It's fallen $113 since since closing at 225 yesterday. Oh boy. So it's at 111 right now as we record this. So is this the is would just is this what you would say uh the house like writing the ship fix regulating and fixing this? Okay. And and this is where and this is where I think my own my own feelings about this situation have matured and evolved as more information has become available. I'm, sure. I'm a strong proponent in admitting when you were wrong or admitting that new information has um, influenced how you feel about a situation. Sure. And, you know, I was very much in, in the boat of there are no good guys in this situation. I still don't believe there are good guys. I think there are there are negative positions, and I think there are neutral positions. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that anybody... I, I don't know that there's a ton of good. Now, there is good that's come out of this. Uh, you have a number of um, people in the Wall Street Bets community who are turning around and taking some of their... Uh, their gains and making big charitable contributions with them. So that I, is a that is good. That's correct. I saw one uh, local. I believe it was local to Philly. Uh, he took some of his GameStop wins and bought a bunch of switches and sent them to Children's Hospital. That's mm -hmm. perfect. That's exactly. That's awesome. Yes, it is. Um, what we what we have now though is we've seen that, and the feeling here is that Robinhood and others have you know stopped allowing stock to be purchased. For GameStop and AMC and BlackBerry and the other meme stocks, there were like 10 meme stocks. Right. Um, and, of course, people getting ticker symbols wrong has been funny because, like, the corpse of Blockbuster suddenly had a huge share price jump. <laughs> oh, no. So that was that was fun. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, fi financial necromancy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we know that, like, that, that Melvin lost 30%. Melvin, which is a, which is a hedge fund, uh... They lost thirty percent of their value from the start of the of the calendar year. Wow! Um, and Citron, which is actually the company that was involved on Friday the twenty second, uh, closed out their position at a hundred percent loss. Oh, so, man. but what we're hearing is that some of them in that lull, where it was real high and they knew it was going to go low, they doubled down and they reshorted at that high value. Oh wow! So there is this feeling. That um, that the hedge funds, you know, are leveraging their relationships 
to uh, to further manipulate the market. Now, you, I, I saw this interview with a former SEC lawyer, and he was talking about how, you know, in the Securities Exchange Act, you know, if, if this is considered collusion and they were doing it purposely to force another another uh, person's hand, making them buy or sell, which is essentially what would happen if you were trying to force a short squeeze. Well, that would be that would be against the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. And the, and the host asked, OK, so how is that different than someone from a hedge fund coming on CNBC and stating their position and trying to rally people to their position? And I think that that's what's been really interesting about this is the uh, this has forced us to examine the power dynamics and understand that the market deregulation that has happened over the past 30 years has uh, helped enshrine wealth mm -hmm. in uh, with hedge funds, with the, with the rich already. So people, the average person uh, who may be using their stimulus check to make this investment, you know, that's someone who is who is taking advantage of information that is provided to them publicly, you know, f except for the, the short time where they had to private make the uh, Wall Street bets forum private because they exceeded their block numbers or something like that. Wow. They couldn't block any more people because they were getting flooded. Um, you know, that's publicly available information if you know where to look. And now it seems like there are services that have popped up that are examining Reddit and other social media to get a sense of where where this traffic might be localized. And all of that comes down to my feeling here is that while there has been this resurgence, and I'm really thrilled that um, average people were able to leverage this information, better their lives, pay off medical bills. Um, again, we live, in a, we live in one of the few countries that does not have socialized medicine. So using this to pay off medical bills is wonderful. Veterinary bills, paying off a car, paying down some student loans, paying down credit card debt, you know, just ensuring that people can live a little bit better. I'm all for that. Sure. My, my concern is that um, the hedge funds adapt. They have the power. They are going to keep the power without regulation. And while I would love to see something like this force an examination and investigation and regulation of the market um, so that it does become more equitable, um, what I'm afraid is happening now, especially as there are services that study uh, social media now, it's just another tool for Wall Street. They mm -hmm. have a new toy to play with, and it's a new data point, and Wall Street thrives on data. That was actually so, my, uh, my going to be my next question. Where do you see the legacy of this besides, you know, Netflix movies um, and things of the like? What do you see as the lasting effects of this whole situation? I, unless there is – now, we have heard that there may be an investigation. There has been some talk that the Robin Hood CEO is going to have to go in front of the House and, um, and answer questions about this. If there is no regulation that comes out, if this does not cause an investigation – of our market systems, of our economy, or at least this piece of our economy, um, then it was—it's it's a flash in the pan. And you know, yeah, Reddit will try again at some point, and and more power to them. They'll find other stocks that are heavily shorted, and they will try to—they will try to, in you know, at the same time, make money and screw hedge funds. Sure. Um, and I and I think that's great. You know, I have no love for hedge funds here, um, but I, I think that if there is not regulation that comes out of this. It ends up being just another consideration for Wall Street and one more thing for them to navigate. And because they have the money and the power, they'll figure out a way to do it. Yeah. So that's it. It's definitely it's a double edged sword. It's a good thing uh, in a in a bubble because it shows a vulnerability in the market. But as you've mm -hmm. said, if the market is very good at one thing, it's using data to cap these vulnerabilities. So it right. could just be a. Um, Something that we talk about and laugh about at the end of the year, but nothing really comes of it. Yep. Um, and here's a story that just popped up. Uh, Fed's Kaplan says he sees no, quote, systemic worries with GameStop stock market media. Hmm. There was my, my big concern about GameStop and AMC, which, hey, look, AMC was able to turn around and manage to pay off all of its debt that it, that it accumulated during the pandemic because it wasn't able to operate because nobody's going to a movie theater. Right, right. But my concern here is that when you decouple... It, when you de if this were one stock, if it were just GameStop, and you were decoupling the value of the shares from the company's performance to make a point and make some money, you know you're really you're really shining a light. You do this for ten stocks, fifteen, twenty. If you do this for if, if this starts to snowball, 
and this happens more often, and you shake faith in the market. Now, I'm not saying the market works well. I'm not saying that it's fair. I'm not saying that it's good. But if it if it changes uh, and, and puts cracks in the foundation of people's understanding of how it works, then you run the risk of destabilizing the market a bit. And that affects people who are simply invested for their retirement. Because if right. the entire market gets thrown into a people, now I lived through 2008, 2009. I took a bath on a house that we had to sell. I saw friends laid off. And remember, we live in a country that doesn't have socialized medicine. So yeah, people my, uh, need their jobs for, for health care. My dad was a victim. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, his company he had worked for my entire life uh, shut down. The lab shut down. And mm-hmm. he lost his job and he was out of work for a long time. It was a scary time. Scary, yes. scary time. So yeah, I remember that very well. So that's my big fear. And that's, you know, that's comes from a personal place of, of, you know, trauma and fear over living through 2008, 2009, working in the nonprofit sector, which was hit especially hard. Sure. sure. Um, and of course we weren't the only ones who were hit hard, but, um, but, but having gone through that, uh, looking at how this might hurt people who are simply saving for retirement, that worries me. Now mm-hmm. it looks like things, you know, the feds not worried about it. Well, hopefully the Fed turns around and look. I hope that's not an excuse to not investigate and regulate because there's a problem in the market right now. This exposed that there's some stuff going on that needs to be that needs some scrutiny. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully something will come of that because I don't think they were worried about the high housing crisis either, and that blew up right in their face. Um, mm-hmm. So hopefully, I'm I'm with you on that. Hopefully something will come of this and they will learn from their mistakes and. Um, Hopefully, uh, we'll be talking about this as a changing point, as a point of inflection, and not just a point of reflection uh, later on. I, I would love that. Honestly. Yes, as would I. Uh, real quick, though, before we adjourn, before I let you go for the day, I want to talk about news that broke yesterday, and that is Google Stadia changing its focus. No longer uh, doing any internally developed games, instead being specifically a third-party partner for gaming streaming. Um, A lot of us were shocked but not surprised, if that makes sense, because it just Mm -hmm. seemed like it was um, troubled from the shoot. But uh, I wanted to get your opinion on why this changed now and if you thought it was as inevitable as some of the other experts out there did. What do you make of this? I I do think it was inevitable. Amanda and I, uh, so Amanda Farrow, who is uh, my partner, my my podcast co-host, my business partner. And uh, great. She and, Let's just put she's that wonderful. There. She's, she's wonderful. Yes. And she and I were uh, commissioned by a client about a year ago to write a white paper on cloud gaming. And one of the things that we pointed out was Google Stadia, uh, about Google Stadia, was that there are a couple of problems involved. One, the business model does not fit. Uh, and the library did not back up that business model for sure. So unlike something like xCloud, which is tied to Game Pass, so it's not really a standalone service, it's tied to your to your subscription service, you're not paying for individual games. Right. You're not spending $60 to play a game on xCloud you, or uh, NVIDIA GeForce, which is a subscription, gives you access to a library. More of a Netflix type of deal. Instead, sure. Instead of just paying for the service and then extra stuff on top of it. Absolutely. And both of those are cloud services. Yep. Um, so you're getting those games. You're not paying for a game you might already own, for right. instance. And that was the problem with the Stadia library, was that it didn't really have anything you hadn't already played. Those These weren't very many new releases. They were games that were a year old. And in a lot of ways, it reminded me of the Wii U's rollout. Sure. Where yep. it's like, hey, look at this new console from Nintendo. We're finally going to let you play all these third-party games that you played a year ago on another platform. Yeah, true. So that was that was a big part of it. Uh, the other part for me was uh, just their internal development, the way it was rolled out. You know, they brought Jade Raymond on, who um, who is best known for the original Assassin's Creed. She was yes. a producer on that. Um, she has been at EA. I think she helped found Motive Studio. Uh, she, she's been in a couple of different places and I think that this was a situation where she was not, she was set up to fail and she was brought in. I don't think she started very much before Stadia was really rolled out at GDC. So that was March of 2019 and founding an internal studio. 
So when you think about that, if you're starting a new studio and you're bringing on, you're starting to bring on new talent, you're starting to staff up, that means, hey, you don't have a prototype probably. Uh, you don't have a vertical slice. Development takes years, as we know. When is this going to pay off? So then they turn around and they hire Alex Hutchinson. Or they, they buy Alex Hutchinson studio. I think that was the week that Journey to the Savage Planet came out. So they're bringing on a studio that hadn't even shipped or was just shipping their first game on multiple platforms. So on console and PC. I don't think it was ready for uh, for Stadia until a while. No, I think, in fact, Alex Hutchinson tweeted out yesterday that the, I, that, it, that the game just launched on Stadia. Yesterday. The day they're so, announcing that they're not the doing The day they're announcing. <laughs> and he kind of oh, subtweeted the news before it broke. So it was really interesting. Like, I saw the tweet go live. I'm like, what is he talking about? Oh, is this one? Uh, is it Savage Planet uh, Employee of the Month Edition is out there yeah. in Stadia? What a crazy coincidence. What a time to be alive. Yes. Wow. So that was 20 <laughs> minutes before the news broke. Oh, my God. So, and, and, and it was the weirdest thing because I saw that I happened to be looking at Twitter when, that hit my, when it hit the timeline. And I'm like, huh, what is he talking about? Oh, <laughs> got it. <laughs> not great not great so so they buy this studio that was just about to ship a game now i want to reflect back on when thq went bankrupt and if you look at all the studios that were purchased when thq went bankrupt uh, the one that wasn't was vigil games and vigil had just shipped darksiders 2 which meant that it did not have another game in the hopper which made it impossible for them to sell right so the fact that they bought up, they brought they bought a studio that was just about to ship one game probably had not done much more than basic concepting on the next game, if that. Again, we're talking about years of turnaround. Maybe 18, 12, 24 months if it's a small game, but could be significantly longer. See Cyberpunk 2077, which was first announced in 2012. Yes, exactly. Or 2013, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, right right around then. So, but yeah, we understand how long development takes. So bringing on Jade to lead production right before you're announcing the platform or really showing off the platform for the first time, you know, leads us to believe like, okay, this isn't going to bear fruit for a few years yet. Bringing on a studio that had was just about to launch its game means their next game's not going to be for a couple of years down the road. Right. I, their, their internal development started so late, it seems, that it never really had a chance. Additionally, Google has a really bad track record of spinning projects up, not supporting them, and winding them down. I think this is just the first step for Stadia to go away. I do not think their subscriber base is going to bear out what's going on. I think that unless, if you're a developer, unless they're throwing a ton of money at you with a, uh, a timed exclusive so you can actually launch your game everywhere else later... Uh, it's probably not a good idea to launch your game as a Stadia exclusive. Uh, I, I think that every one of those games is going to be a Towerfall situation where it's going to be the thing that you want to play on that platform if you want to buy that platform or buy into that platform. But no one's really going to want to buy into the platform. Was that an Ouya reference? It was an Ouya wow. reference. That's how you know uh, I picked somebody who knows they're talking about it. If they're, if they're sourcing <laughs> the Ouya <laughs> oh man! And eventually, that game did come out on other platforms. So you actually answered exactly. My, you answered my question before I asked it. Would would there be enough money for Google to throw at anyone to make their game a a third party at least a full on, if not a timed, uh, Stadia exclusive? I would think I, not. I would say yes, actually. And here's why: uh, if you look at how that money flows, if I'm an independent developer and they're desperate for exclusives i'm going to turn around and say i want a minimum guarantee this okay. is what my game would have sold if it were on all of these platforms i want to have that money on day one regardless of how many sales i have and and by the way egs epic game store works on guaranteed minimums we yes, know that from from the ooblets post yep. Yep, yep. So, uh, and we had suspected that before, but that confirmed it. Also, I just want to let you know that GameStop just slid under 100. It's oh, no! Yeah. It's over! Yeah, Run! It's, it, Trade we, it we in crashed, now! Yeah, crashed through the floor. Anyone who trades in the stock now is just going to get the realistic GameStop experience. They bought it for, what? 50, oh, jeez. 50, 60% more than they're going to get back for it? Yeah, but you can get a couple bucks more if you take the store credit. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> Oh. So, yeah, we're, we're fully in free fall. So back to Stadia. You know, yeah, Google has plenty of money that it could throw around if it wants to. And 
I think that if, if you're an indie developer and you're looking at a timed exclusivity deal and you're like, all right, so we launch it on Stadia. We get all the money we, we would need up front to know that we're, that we're financially secure for a year. And we can start working on our next game. And when the year is up, we launch it on Steam, EGS, Switch, uh, PlayStation, Xbox, you know, and we turn around, we do our real launch. Hey, finally, everybody else can play this game. And by that point, Stadia might not even exist. Who Correct. knows? Yep. So I, I think that there is a situation where where developers would absolutely take this deal for financial security. Does it mean that they should... If I were them, though, I would consider that your your timed exclusivity, when that's up, that's your real launch. Mm-hmm. Because the number of people who are going to actually play it... For instance, it's the like the, the games that are coming over from the Wii U to the Switch. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's like all these games, oh, I wanted to play that on Wii U, but there was no way... I was going to buy a Wii U. Now I can finally play most of the Switches or most of the Wii U's library on the Switch. There are a couple of games left that yeah. haven't made the jump. Big launch next week. Yeah. Big absolutely. launch next week. It's a perfect example. Super Mario uh, 3D World. That game is so good, too. Plus, yes, it is. It's a very, very good one. I'm very excited for Bowser's Fury just to see how mm-hmm. they're experimenting mm-hmm. uh, with Mario. It, it, it reminds me almost of a Link Between Worlds uh, experiment yeah. with Zelda before Breath of the Wild. Getting yeah, us absolutely. ready for a radical change in Mario, which I am. Uh, very much excited for. So one last uh, little rider question to that. You said that a, a developer might take that deal for security. You're talking about a smaller indie studio, right? There's no way a third party is going to give them an exclusive. Like, no, like, I like don't a think so. Or Ubisoft, nothing like that. No, I think the only thing we've ever seen like that, and again, we're talking about far different scales between sure. the Stadia and what I'm about to say, which is the Xbox One. Yep. Remember that Square Enix signed a deal for timed exclusivity for the first two Tomb Raider games, or is it just the first one? Uh, first two. I don't think I don't okay. think Shadow... Um, or actually, it might right, Shadow, been, Shadow Simul launched. It might have just been Rise, launched. actually, in 2015. No, it was the very first one. I know, because the, the very first Tomb, the Tomb Raider reboot was an Xbox 360, Xbox One exclusive. 2013, okay, and then Rise... Yeah, that was 2013, Rise was 2015. Definitely was yep. also a year exclusive. Okay. Um, so yeah, you're, yeah, you're, yeah, uh, yeah. That sounds right. So that w- and again, you're talking about Microsoft, which is an, um, operating at a much different scale, much larger scale than Stadia. Even with how poorly they did during the Xbox One era compared to where they were during Xbox 360, or okay. even where I think they're going to be for Xbox Series. Sure. Yep. So okay. no, to answer your question, I don't see a major publisher taking that deal. What I do see is major publishers taking money to port their games over to Stadia. And I think that is where Google's going to throw its money. But here's the thing. I don't think that, that they're going to, they're going to get a lot of catalog games where it's like, Oh, they're sitting there. It's low margin or high margin for us because the work's already done. They're going to pay for the porting. So that's all win at that point. That's all win. Even if they sell a handful of copies, if the porting's paid for, there's, there's really no, no reason not to take the deal. Right. But in terms of, uh, in terms of voluntarily bringing games over without without a check attached to that, no. I don't. No. There's no reason. And then, uh, so these would all be games you think that have launched previously, or would they launch on Stadia as well? Depends on the money involved, honestly. Yeah. Because I think that at, in no in no way is a publisher going to say, "Yeah, sure, we'll just voluntarily bring our game over to Stadia." No, there's going to be money attached to that, and if it's simultaneous with the launch of all the other platforms, it's going to be a lot more money. Sure. That makes sense. All right, uh, Mr. Futter, I appreciate your uh, advice and your uh, uh, your guidance here today. You've really answered a lot of questions on what is going on on the business side. Uh, I may keep you on voluntary retainer. If yeah, there's any, uh, any other business things that happen later on that we need a uh, explanation on, I might hit you up because this has been be great, great, fascinating fa- uh, information. But when you're not moonlighting here on Cheese Days and Controllers, where can people find you? Let's see. On Twitter, uh, I am personally at Futterish, F-U-T-T-E-R-I-S-H. You can also find Virtual Economy, the podcast I co-host with Amanda Farrow, at Virtual Econcast. Uh, and we have a website for the show as well, uh, virtualeconcast.com. All right. Thank you again, Mr. Futter. We appreciate your time and your uh, advice. This is My Mike pleasure. Futter, everybody. Yes, that was Mike Futter talking about the GameStop stock situation. If you still don't understand it, neither do I. It's really a lot to wrap your head around. And um, if you bought into it and you're still holding, good luck and Godspeed. I am not in that boat, and I am happy to be standing on the shores chewing popcorn, watching you uh, gamble your financial health away. Uh, But to round out this trio of interviews tonight, we have one that I am very excited because... 
Cyber Shadow came out last week by Yacht Club Games and Mechanical Head. Brought me back to a time of innocence where games were so hard, I wanted to pull my six-year-old hair out, but I was doing it at the age of 34. I only wish I had more hair. Uh, and with me right now is the marketing manager of Yacht Club Games, Celia Schilling, to talk about that and all things Yacht Club. Celia, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? I'm doing wonderful and uh, happy to have you uh, on the show. So yes, I do want to break into Cyber Shadow a little bit. What a love letter uh, to retro games of that era. Your Ninja Guidance, your Striders, your Ninja platformer style games. Uh, when this pitch was first brought to Yacht Club uh, by Mechanical Head, who, by the way, was one man who made this entire game, which blows me away, uh, what, what drew you to it? Uh, was it the retro flair? Was it the, the different mechanics he was putting in? What was the first uh, impression of the game when it was first seen by Yacht Club? So this is actually a really funny story. So Arne, he's the creator, um, he actually didn't bring it to us. We went to him. Really? Um, one of, yeah. One of my colleagues, David, actually saw some screenshots of like an early Cyber Shadow that were posted by Arne on Twitter. And he saw it and was like, wow, like this looks amazing. And he showed it to the rest of the team and we're a pretty collaborative process. So like all of us like got our word in and we're like, wow, this looks amazing. We, we have to talk to this guy. So David uh, sent him an email or contacted him, on, contacted him on Twitter. I'm not sure what the exact process was. And we're like, hey, like we'd love to get involved in this this 8-bit fun that you're, you're, you're creating. And um, initially, Arne was like, no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, oh, oh, okay. Um, but let us know. And then like after communicating like through email and social media um, and like Arne, who had an initial like no publisher role, um, started to realize like the wealth of um, like help that we'd be able to offer. And um, we basically as like a publisher, you know, it, we'd be hands on, but it'd be his complete vision. And once he understood that, uh, we started to work together. And that was actually like a few years ago. Yeah, uh, it it was when when did you first see it? What it was it around like Shovel Knight launch twenty fourteen later? Oh no, it was it was like yeah, so like three years ago. So that'd be like twenty like nineteen twenty eighteen uh, twenty eighteen. I want to say okay. Um, I I could be wrong on that, but around that range. Okay, so it made its first appearance uh, at least in my eyes. Uh, I saw it first at E three twenty nineteen. I was mm -hmm. immediately drawn to it. Uh, for that retro flair. Now, obviously, this was a man who was not in Yacht Club, but his game fit Yacht Club, uh, considering Shovel Knight was another piece of retro greatness. Um, is that what drew you to this game? You think that's what, what made Yacht Club want to pursue it because it was a game that fit right into the wheelhouse, right from the jump? Um, I guess like, there's like a mixed answer with that because... You know, as like as Yacht Club Games, not only are we developers, but we're gamers as well. So it was definitely a type of game that we personally wanted to like play. And like personally, like I'm a retro gamer. I love the 8-bit era, like of NES and the 16-bit of Super Nintendo like generation. So um, it, it just fit with the company, and it just so happened to be also be like a pixel art style game. So I think it just worked out rather than us saying like, oh, we need to look for this type of era of style of games. Now, was this the first game, this was not the first game you've ever published. You published um, an Azure Striker, I believe, a little, yes. a little while back, the physical compilation. But this is the first game you ever uh, published, not self-developed, from the jump, right? Like, this was, this was uh, pitched to you, or you pitched to him, I guess I should say. And you have the publishing rights, and you put it out at launch day. It wasn't like a compilation, it wasn't anything like that. Is that correct? Um, okay, so for that, yeah, so Gunvolt, that was like we helped into create to bring it to the States. But yeah, so for Cyber Shadow, this was a hand, our first hands on publishing experience. But when we initially um, got Cyber Shadow in our hands, Arne was actually almost done with the game. Oh. And that's where we actually got started. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine how much work he put into this on a daily basis. Did he give you any insight into what his days looked like while he was developing this game all by himself? I can't imagine, like, countless nights from working closely with Arne for marketing. Like, he lives in Finland, by the way, so our hours oh, are, like, flipped. So in the morning, it's, like, super late for him, and that's usually when I converse with him. But he'll be awake at, like, 5 p.m., and I'll be like, Arne, like, what are you, what are you doing? Go to sleep. Oh, <laughs> oh, that, so... Uh... 
yeah, countless hours and um, our team, like uh, when we did work together, we can get into it in a little bit, but um, yeah, like the feedback that we were going back and forth with him on the game's uh, development, it, it was really fun. <laughs> so, so walk me through that process a little bit. Obviously the time difference was one of your biggest challenges, but when you're, when you're, if he's almost already done this game and you're now coming in for the publishing side of it, is this really where, um, so w when it comes to Yacht Club's uh job i guess once this partnership is forged are you are you simply the marketing and the distribution side of it then uh actually okay so when he had his finished game let me clarify so he had like pretty much cyber shadow like completed uh right. the outline everything it, it looks it's kind of similar to how it is now. But the thing is though, is that as we were going through the levels, you know, we provided our collective pool of experience for feedback on the levels. So we did we did offer some tweaks on like level design, introducing gameplay elements, like some levels were made shorter, some were made longer, um, introducing different story elements, because there's a lot of fun story chalked in there. And like sometimes we felt that it would fit better like a little bit later or a little bit sooner so we helped make him have him make certain tweaks for the game and like we helped him um figure out how to introduce like enemies gradually while combining them with level hazards so we helped him like put the last polish on the game itself and then for that yeah so we had our, our time period of when we could communicate with him and so he would send us a new build of the game we'd play through it we'd give our feedback and yeah that was basically the process so was the game more or less difficult when before you got your hands on it? From what I've heard, uh, it was way more difficult. Oh my but goodness! <laughs> Arne, what are you doing, sir? <laughs> I know, just just doing his thing. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I, did, did someone make him angry? Like, I, I'm going to make this game, and you will never beat it. And that's just how it's going to be. Uh, so, all right. So then, I have two specific questions about who came up with what idea. Whose idea was the swag blade? Definitely Arne's. Because that is all of it's Arne. <laughs> all of it's Arne. Oh, so it's hit. So those little tracking bugs that uh, will hit you and then leave. They were his fault too. Uh, then yeah, I, they're his fault. <laughs> we didn't have words because those bugs, especially who. You know what? I'm sorry. I'm going to vent a little bit here. Who puts an elevator scene, an elevator section in the second level of the game? Arne. I you're killing me. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I've died countless times. Everyone's like, because you know, at the end of the game, um, you get a uh, like a kill count of how many times you died. Yeah. And I, uh, yeah, my mine's. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> oh, mine, I think, was uh, tilt. Um, there's way too many. Uh, but yeah. So, but it's it's a wonderful game. I don't mean to to get angry or anything like that. It is it's absolutely a wonderful uh, wonderful game. You did a fantastic job, and any input that you put in was the right one because it really came out. Uh, just as if it was yanked from the NES days and brought into 2021. Uh, so my kudos to you and him. It was obviously um, a, a letter of love to that bygone era. And um, anyone who plays it on Game Pass or Switch or whatever they're playing it on, uh, definitely mm -hmm. worth it. So I do want to get into a little bit of Yacht Club uh, for a little bit. You found your niche in the retro style game, starting with Shovel Knight and ending with, well, Shovel Knight, uh, besides <laughs> Cyber Shadow and Azure Striker, uh, were you, have you? How long have you personally been with Yacht Club since the beginning? Uh, actually, no. Um, I have been one of the newest hires at Yacht Club Games. Um, I got brought on almost a year ago. Oh. I interviewed in February, and they hired me in March, and then uh, the world <laughs> shut down. <laughs> the, the world just turned off, and all of a sudden, you're working a brand new job from home. That's awkward. Yeah, no, it was cool. It was cool. Um, what was great about Yacht Club Games is that once we started to notice that uh, things might uh, go for the worse, um, we basically made sure that everyone was prepared to be able to work from home. So everyone brought home their setups. And for me, getting my setup uh, organized, it was a really fairly smooth process. Cool. That's cool. And anytime that can... Uh, every story I hear of a smooth process like that during this time just makes me very happy because there are people who did not have that so the fact that you were able to start this job with very little hiccups uh, is good and, and, and a testament to Yacht Club and what they do uh, so I want to get into a little bit of what's coming up next from Yacht Club I'm looking at a list here uh, looks like Shovel Knight Dig is on the <laughs> agenda uh, the rogue light dungeon crawler in the Shovel Knight series uh, Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon is also uh, one of yours coming up but I don't see anything here self uh, developed self published is there uh, or at least not by yourselves. Is there something in the works, uh, without getting into specifics, obviously, 
Um, are you guys doing any in, in-house development at the moment, or are you focusing on the uh, publisher side? So that would be really cool. Um, <laughs> there's nothing to announce as sure. of yet. Sure, but sure, sure. I would suggest any listener to check out our social media pages and website. Whenever we're able to announce something, we definitely post there first. Yes, I, I would imagine <laughs> that uh, Yacht Club is an instant follow. And I feel like that... Um, that statement you just gave is one that you have to give often. So I'm very sorry for you to have to give that here. What? I just um, made that up right now. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't written on ingrained into your skull anywhere at all. Um, nope. <laughs> but uh, so one last question then uh, with Cyber Shadow now out in the world. Um, if there are any other uh, up and coming indie developers, solo or otherwise, who have a retro focused game like this. Uh, what would be the best way to potentially get in contact with you at Yacht Club uh, to bring their game to you to maybe become the next Cyber Shadow? So for that, I would like to prevent, uh, well, I guess provide a disclaimer. Like, we're not just actively looking for games. Sure. So if you have something special and you're like, you want to share it with us, uh, we're definitely open to check it out. Because um, we, we want to help bring games not only through our development process, but help bring games that we'd want to play and bring into the world as well. So for that, you could contact us um, on our website uh, at mediayachtclubgames.com, and you can share your story with us, and we'd love to check it out, whether we're able to help out or not. Uh, we still love hearing about new games. Like, I, I love games. Yeah. <laughs> I want to play it. <laughs> what are you playing right now? Oh, man, I am playing a whole plethora of games. Um, I'm playing a few indie titles like a House Flipper as well as Night in the Woods. I'm playing some retro titles uh, like the Spyro Collector series and Jack and Daxter 2. Um, and always, like, I revisit, like, Nintendo, like, Game Boy games, like, Link to the Past oh, and Oracle Seasons. Yeah, so. There you go. Anything, uh, anything coming on the horizon not from Yacht Club that has you particularly excited? That's a good question. There's so many. Um, my whole entire brain right now is Cyber Shadow. Yeah, but that's fair. like <laughs> honestly, that's fair. so that is 110 percent my focus right now. So I, I'm blanking. But uh, there's <laughs> totally a bunch of titles. Like if I if I watch a trailer or like the Nintendo World indie trailer, I, I'm pretty sure I'll be stoked about all of them. Yeah, yeah. Th- th- those I miss those trailers. If if anyone from Nintendo is listening to this, to make sure that they don't, you, you know, Yacht Club doesn't spill any secrets. Can we get a new? Uh, can we get a new presentation? Indie World, a full direct, something. We love those videos. Actually, uh, the most recent one, Cyber Shadow, was in. Um, that's right. That actually was. I want to say it was in December. It was like December fifteenth. Yeah, so. yeah, right before Christmas. Good timing mm-hmm. there. Um, but you know, you know, uh, the gaming faithful. They, they, that, that, that satiate that. The satiating videos only last so long, uh, Mm -hmm. and eventually they're clamoring for more. But I will let you go now. I really appreciate your time to talk about Cyber Shadow with me real quick and all things Yacht Club. Love the games you put out. Love everything that you're doing. Looking forward to what's coming next. Celia Schilling, everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And there you have it. That is Celia Schilling from Yacht Club Games talking about Cyber Shadow, the latest and greatest from the retro-focused studio. And with that, that brings us to the end of episode 34 of the Cheesesteaks and Controllers podcast. As always, I am eSports and Gaming Insider Jason Finelli, and this has been episode 34 of Cheesesteaks and Controllers for Fox PHL The Gambler, 102.5 FM, 1480 AM, and iHeartRadio. Thank you to our sponsor, Ghost Shaver. Remember, ghostshaver.com. Check that out. And uh, this time next week, we will be back with more of the latest and greatest in the world of esports and gaming. Until then, thank you as always, and goodbye.